Good afternoon and welcome to Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello. It's easy to remember how to pronounce it. Just remember black and yellow, okay? <laughs> I learned that from one of my classes years ago. And I will be your professor for all of these lectures in this course, I think 25 lectures, in virology. I am a professor at the Medical Center, which is way uptown. I have been there for 38 years, running a lab researching viruses. And about 10 years ago, I decided to come down here and teach this course. Because can you imagine all the money you're paying to go to school here, there was no virology course. <laughs> Unacceptable. And so I decided to teach this course. I don't have to do it. All I need to do is do my research and raise grant money. If you're at a medical center, that's typically the story. You don't have to teach very much. But I wanted to teach virology, so that's why I'm doing this. I'm doing this out of a love for the subject. I absolutely love viruses and virology. Just ask my family. They'll tell you I love them more than them. <laughs> they complain all the time. They are the coolest things on the planet. You're going to learn something in every lecture uh, in, in this semester that's amazing, <laughs> that you'd never heard about before, and that you're going to want to tell someone else. So I'm really excited about this field, and I want to impart some of that excitement to you. The other way I look at it is, as you'll see, viruses infect everything on the planet. They've been here before there was life on the planet. And so they, they have a role in how everything works. If you want to understand organisms, how they interact, how they exist, you need to know about viruses. And more specifically, if you want to understand human health and human disease, you need to know about viruses. So that's why I'm teaching this course. And by the end of it, you are going to know more virology than 99.9% .9 of the people on this earth. Because I'm going to tell you everything I know. We live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. They are everywhere. They infect every living thing on the planet. They are floating in this room. You're inhaling and exhaling them. In fact, every one of you is infected. You're infected throughout your lives, probably starting in utero. You become infected with viruses. And most of those infections don't have any negative consequence. We think they might have positive benefits for us, but we're still figuring that out. And that's a theme that we'll come back to throughout this course. How can viruses be good? In addition to living and breathing and eating them on a daily basis, they're part of our genetic material. A good fraction, in fact, uh, are parts of our genetic material. And they, over evolution, have contributed to our genes. We use ancient viruses that have come into our genomes today to make our genes work. And we'll talk about that in this course. And as I said, they infect every living thing on the planet, everything you see here, and microscopic life, everything. Every, even a planarian a worm, a fly, everything is infected with viruses, and usually multiple viruses. And everything on the planet has viruses, has viral sequences integrated into their chromosomal DNA. So they're just everywhere. It's, it's amazing. Now, the, one of the uh, amazing aspects of virology is numbers. There are so many viruses on the planet. And this is a little insidious because you can't see them. So most people have no clue that they are so pervasive. They have no idea that viruses are everywhere. And so when there's an outbreak, people get scared because they think this is what happens only during the outbreak. But in fact, viruses are always uh, around us. Here's, here's an amazing statistic. Just, if you just look at the viruses that infect bacteria in the ocean, you know, we used to think that there were very few microbes in the ocean. And 20 years ago, all that changed. It's full of microbes and it's full of viruses. Uh, among the other things that are in the oceans are bacteria. And there are viruses that infect them. They're called bacteriophages. There are 10 to the 30th bacteriophages in the waters of this planet. And people have 
done that by measuring particle counts in different parts of the oceans. It's a huge number. It's just too big to even wrap your head around. It's bigger than Avogadro, right? Um, and if you take that number, you can do some interesting things with it. First of all, if you, if you consider the weight of a bacteriophage, one weighs about a femtogram. If you multiply that times 10 to the 30th, you exceed the biomass of elephants, elephants by over a thousand fold. And these are particles you can't see. There's just so many of them that their weight is incredible. And the other is that if you line these up, here's a bacteriophage here on the left, uh, illustrated. Um, we'll talk more about these later. If you line them up head to tail, these 10 to the 30th phages go 100 million light years into space. That's how many 10 to the 30th is. It's a remarkable number. And that's part of the strategy of viruses, to make lots and lots of progeny. Very few will actually succeed in infecting a host. But that is their strategy for doing that. So numbers is amazing. And if you look at all the organisms that are infected, of course, they add to that. The number I just gave you, by the way, is just viruses in the oceans. The viruses elsewhere are also numerous. And the numbers that are excreted by particular animals is really remarkable. Here's a whale, right? A huge a humpback whale. And these can be infected with a variety of viruses. They can actually get sick. They can get gastroenteritis. They can get blisters. There's some small RNA viruses that infect these animals. And here, 10 to the 13th, that's the number of virus particles that an infected whale will excrete in a day. 10 to the 13th per day. That's one whale. And of course, those viruses go into the oceans. They can infect other animals, mammals in the oceans, fish as, as well. And that's just whales. Every animal is infected in some way. If you take a closer look at the oceans, uh, I like to say viruses are not just purveyors of bad news, although most people think they are because they're only familiar with the viruses that make you sick. And those are a handful among the billions that are out there. There are more viruses in a liter of coastal seawater than there are people on the planet. So the next time you go swimming in the ocean and you take in a mouthful of water to spit it at your friend, it's full of viruses. They're probably not going to hurt you. It's OK. But there are a lot of viruses in there. Now, here on the bottom are two interesting pie charts. On the left, we're looking at uh, prokaryotes, protists, and viruses in terms of biomass, how much weight of each is in the ocean. And you can see the biomass is mostly prokaryotes, bacteria. Uh, and then viruses and protists are a small sliver of that pie. But if you look at particle number, abundance, viruses account for 94% of the particles in the ocean. So a bacteria would be a particle, a protist would be a particle, and a virus. There are many more viruses than anything else. And the ocean is in a particularly amazing place for viruses. It turns out there's something like 10 to the 16th infections per second in the oceans, per second, of a virus infecting a bacteria and lysing it. And if you think about this, that's a huge amount of organic matter that's being broken up, right? The virus infects the bacteria, the bacteria break up, this organic matter sinks, and then it gets processed and recycled. So it turns out that viruses are really important in geo cycles on the earth, recycling all kinds of organics. And without them, if we took all the viruses away at any given time, I think life would have a big problem on this planet. Here's another really amazing number. We'll talk, we'll actually have an entire lecture on uh, human immunodeficiency virus type one, the causative agent of the AIDS pandemic. And there are at the moment, about 35 million people infected. And from that, we know how many virus genomes there are on the planet. There are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes today on the planet. This pandemic is still running unabated. There are lots of people infected. There are many people still infected every day. And we will talk about that in, in some detail. But that number is also huge. Here's one way to look at it. In that number of genomes, and these are RNA viruses, which are the masters of mutation, as you will see, there are mutants resistant to every antiviral we have today. And we have over 30 antivirals which can be used to treat AIDS. So we have in this 10 to the 16th mutations that cause resistance to all of them already and to anything we would ever develop. Because we, we would never make an infinite number of antivirals. 10, 20, 100, 200, whatever we would develop in the coming years, we, there's already resistance out there. That's how big this number is. 
And so that's scary in terms of how viruses reproduce, and it's something we'll come back to as well. We'll have a whole lecture on evolution and a whole lecture on antiviral treatments. So I said before, you're all infected. I would bet money if I took serum from all of you and checked it, I'd find at least one virus, probably more. Uh, by your ages, most of you have some kind of herpes virus, and as you get older, the percentage of individuals who are herpes virus positive increases. There are about a dozen different herpes viruses, and they're shown here. Herpes simplex one and two are, are quite common. You acquire them really in your early years from your parents who are shedding them. They may have a cold sore or not and still shed virus and infect their children, and you're infected for life. Those genomes stay with you. You can't get rid of them. They harbor very specific cells that we'll talk about, and they have a way of remaining there without causing disease. And so besides herpes simplex 1, we have varicella zoster virus. This used to cause outbreaks of chicken pox in this country. Many people are now immunized, so we don't get that anymore. I had chicken pox as a kid because it, I grew up before the vaccine. And that, again, it causes a rash illness, but the virus stays with you. It remains latent in your ganglia. Uh, human cytomegalovirus, again, infecting most people. And this is an interesting one because if you have an organ transplant and you re receive immunosuppressive drug treatment, that will allow a lot of these herpes viruses to begin replicating. So these are a big problem in transplant units. Epstein-Barr virus is another one, very common uh, cause of mononucleosis, but also of other cancers in humans as well, and then a number of other uh, herpes viruses. We'll talk about some of these later. But again, the point is, once you're infected, it is for life. So a good, a vast number of you have already a number of these herpes viruses and possibly don't even know that you do. You may not be symptomatic. Now, you all undoubtedly know that we have a microbiome. Every part of us, every organ, every tissue has a kind of bacterium or a group of bacteria associated with it. And of course, the microbiome is being touted as the cure for everything. Whatever ails you, just get some bacteria and it may fix it. Well, whether that turns out to be true or not, we'll see. But here we see just a limited number of bacteria associated with specific body sites. You acquire these beginning in utero and you develop them through the, your early years. And they're important for your health, no doubt. But I want to make the case in this course that the viruses in you are also important. We call that the virome. We clearly have a virome that is tissue specific. So on the left, uh, on that picture of a human, are pie charts showing you the, the number of DNA or RNA viruses that have been found in different parts of the body, the nervous system, respiratory tract, your genital tract, and your blood. If I took blood from, from all of you, a good fraction of you would have viruses in your blood, even though you're well. They're there, and as I said, I think they're doing us some good. Now, the human virome is of great interest to us because most of us who do research on viruses are interested in preventing diseases, but people are also interested in the viromes of other things out there. All sorts of animals' viromes are being studied, insects, plants. And there's a, a video there I'm going to play for you. This is one of my favorite. These are people who are interested in whale viromes. How do you sample a whale virome? You're not going to catch a whale. All right? Maybe if you trap it, you could sample it, but people don't want to do that these days, right? We're against trapping whales and so forth. So what they're doing here is they are capturing the blow, right? The exhaled breath of the whale. So here is a, off the coast of Australia. Here are a couple of humpback whales. And this is a drone that's being controlled from a nearby ship. And as the video plays, you'll see the whales come by and the drone has a, um, a little container. It opens up, captures the mist, and then it closes. Isn't that cool? So you can sample that. They bring it back to the lab. There's actually a paper published of the virome in that exhaled breath of the whale. So you can use very clever ways of sampling all sorts of different uh, viromes. Let's talk a little bit about our genome. We will come back to this later, but I just want to get you excited about it. Here's a map of our human genome sequence, 3.2 billion base pairs. 
it's not the biggest of genomes, but it's, it's quite large. And of course, it was sequenced many years ago, and now we have many, many tens of thousands of human genome sequences. One day at birth, everyone will have their genome sequenced. Uh, and here is a breakdown of some of the components. I find this always interesting that the protein coding genes are not, uh, hardly anything, one and a half percent of the 3.2 billion bases, and lots of other things, introns, and uh, all sorts of other things. But uh, the one I want to point out to you are these LTR retrotransposons. In fact, all these uh, funny sounding names, lines and signs, these are all uh, transposable elements. These are things that move around the genome. We'll talk about those uh, later on. But the LTR transposons, about 8% of the genome, uh, some of these are actually retroviruses that went into our genome uh, many years ago, probably before we were homo sapiens. And they're still there. In humans, they don't make infectious viruses, but in other species, they do. And we think, and there's some good evidence for this, that they're beneficial. They've been exapted. Exapted means we've taken a viral gene and used it for our own purposes. And I'll tell you later that the placenta, our placentas, wouldn't be there if it weren't for a protein donated by a retrovirus. So it's when I, when I say that everything on the planet has something in its genome that, that's viral, that's what I mean. So most of the viruses that infect us and, and every other thing on the planet are actually not having any bad impact. They have little or no impact on our health and well-being. This is not to say that all viruses are benign, right? You get influenza, you get common colds. There are more serious viral infections, AIDS, of course. Uh, there is Ebola outbreak in Africa, Lassa virus, many, many different serious virus infections. But they, their number pales compared to all the viruses that are out there. So why is it that all these viruses uh, have very little impact on us? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Let me tell you about them. First of all is most viruses you eat and they pass right through you. They're in your food and they're viruses of insects or plants that do not replicate in us, but they will pass through you. And if you have your fecal virome done, you can go online and find a company that uh, will take a sample of your poop and f tell you what viruses are in it. And I get emails all the time by frightened people who say, my poop is full of pepper viruses. What are they going to do to me? And pepper is a thing that a lot of people eat, right? Grind up pepper. Those pepper seeds have viruses in them. They're, they're plant viruses and they don't hurt us. Uh, here's a cool one. It's a study done in Washington, D.C. supermarkets. Cabbage from five different supermarkets were contaminated with baculoviruses. Each serving of, say, coleslaw would have about 10 to the eighth particles of a virus that would be pathogenic for this cabbage looper here. That's this cabbage looper feeds on cabbage and it leaves its viruses behind. You can't wash them off. No matter how you wash your cabbage, you will always have it full of viruses and you eat them, but they're harmless. They don't replicate in you. Here are some other interesting uh, studies. RNA viruses in human feces. Most viral sequences are similar to plant viruses, including the pepper virus. And 91% uh, of those sequences resemble plant plant viruses. And I said the most abundant human fecal virus is pepper mild mottle virus, 10 to the ninth virus particles per gram of dry fecal matter. You can try this at home. You can send your feces into a company and they will tell you, and I guarantee they will find this plant virus, but they're passing through you. So these probably don't have any beneficial effect, but I don't want to conclude for sure. You never know. You might be doing something, but whatever they're doing, they're not replicating in your cells. Here's a great example of a virus that's good. It's not good for us because it doesn't infect us. It infects plants. And I love this story because it's a clear benefit. It's actually a, a mutualism. Uh, this is a virus that infects this grass, Dicanthelium lanuginosum. This is a plant that lives uh, by the hot springs. If you go to Yellowstone or some other park with hot springs, there are grasses that grow right around the hot steaming water. And that's, this is one of them. They can grow. Uh, at temperatures around 55 degrees Celsius. It's quite hot. So you can grow them in the lab at, as well at high temperatures and study this. And it turns out there is a uh, fungus, Curvularia protuberata, that is within the plant itself. It's insinuated into the plant. And that's the key to the high temperature growth. Because if you take the fungus out of the plant, the plant will no longer grow at 55 degrees. 
However, within the fungus, there is yet something else. There's a virus. And that virus is shown here, curvularia protuberata uh, virus. And that virus has to be in the fungus in order for the fungus to allow the, the grass to grow at high temperatures. So the virus is helping, the fungus is helping the grass. A clear example of a beneficial virus. You take the virus out of the fungus, the fungus alone will not allow the, the grass to grow at high temperatures. Unfortunately, the kind of experiments you need to do to show this, you can't do in people. You can't infect people and see what happens for the most part. Actually, you can infect people. There are some virus experiments we can do that are non-pathogenic, which we'll talk about later, but uh, these kinds of experiments to see, taking away all your viruses, for example, and see what happens, we can't do that sort of experiment. We actually have no way of doing it because we don't have a drug that will wipe out all of your viruses. Someday we will, people are working on those, and maybe we'll answer that question, is it bad to get rid of your viruses? You know, now if you take antibiotics for whatever infection, you disrupt your microbiome, that can have serious consequences, maybe the same for viruses. But here's an experiment in a mammal, which is close. This is a mouse experiment where we're looking at the effect of a virus on the development of the gut. And so here are sections of small intestine of mice. So here on the right, conventional, those are wild type mice, laboratory strains, but grown normally in the lab. And these are normal villi. They look uh, anatomically correct. And uh, on the bottom here, they're, they're stained for a antigen that identifies T lymphocytes. And these brown cells are T lymphocytes. So the, the gut is full of an immune system, of course. Now, if you uh, grow these mice under germ-free conditions, that is, they have no bacteria in their intestines or anywhere else, you see then that their intestines are malformed. The villi aren't normal, as you can see, and they lack T cells. So the immune system and the morphology of this gut in the absence of bacteria is abnormal. However, if you infect these mice with a virus, this is murine norovirus, MNV. It's related to the virus of cruise ships, the one that makes people uh, have gastroenteritis on cruise ships, makes the cruise ships come back and be sterilized. This is a, the mouse version. Uh, it's, it somewhat restores the morphology of the gut and the T cells return. So the virus can replace, to a certain extent, not fully, the, the morphology of the intestine and the function in terms of the immune system. So that's a tantalizing clue about what viruses are doing. This is the kind of experiment you can do in an animal. You can't do this in people. And I expect we'll see more and more of this as, as we go forward. And in fact, there, there are other evidences to similar extents as well. So some viruses are beneficial. So, as I said, some pass through us. Some viruses are beneficial. And then uh, the, the rest seem to be controlled uh, by our immune system. You have a really amazing immune system. Just part of it's diagrammed here just for, to, for emphasis. How many of you took the immunology Moshewitz course here? So a small number of you have a good knowledge of the immune system. You don't need that to take... Uh, this course, but we will talk a little bit about immunology. And it is that terrific immune system that controls a lot of the infections that we have. It keeps our microbiome in check. I mean, we're full of huge numbers of bacteria, and most of the time, they're not harmful to us. And that's because the immune system is keeping them in check. And the same goes for viruses. All these viruses that are resident in us, in our various tissues, your great immune system keeps them there. And how do we know this? Well, because when your immune system is down, then you have problems. If you have, again, an organ transplant and you receive immunosuppressive drugs, that trashes your immune system, and a lot of these viruses will begin to replicate and cause disease. Uh, or if you have an, another virus infection uh, that immunosuppresses you, and HIV is an example of an immunosuppressive virus, but measles is another one. Measles is one of these infections that replicate, the virus replicates in immune cells, trashes the immune system, and the immune system can't deal with other pathogens. So under those conditions, the simplest virus, which we all deal with quite well, can be a real problem. Uh, so that immune system is another key in why most of the viruses that are in us aren't making us sick. And this is evident in, in this slide, which illustrates 
a particular virus. It's called a polyomavirus. It's shown here in the middle. Uh, we will talk about these extensively in this course because they've been models of understanding molecular biology. Um, but it turns out that there are a number of polyomaviruses that infect us, and they infect pretty much everybody on the planet. You would all, would, again, be infected with these polyomaviruses. They're small DNA-containing viruses that don't seem to do any harm unless you're immunosuppressed. The cool thing about this is they're passed along within families. So your parents give them to you, and you give them to your children and your family members and so forth. And so we can actually track human migration by the kinds of polyomaviruses that people are infected with. We can simply take serum and ask what flavor or what vintage of polyomavirus does this person have or that person. We can track the migration of humans. And that's what's shown on this slide. So in purple is the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa as traced by our genome. You can see it move out of Africa into Europe, across Asia, and into North America, right? If you track human migration by infection with these polyomaviruses, that's the black lines. First of all, you get a way more detailed view because our genome studies aren't detailed enough to get that. Eventually, we'll get there as well. But we can do lots of serology. We can take people's blood and ask what virus antibodies are present there. And you can see a very detailed examination of where people migrated. We have the Australo-Asia migration and into South America as well. So this is an example of a virus that doesn't make us sick, except in unusual situations, but can be used to trace other things as well. In short, virology is an amazing subject. Viruses are amazing. And that's what I'm going to try and convince you of uh, in this course. And in particular, virology is an integrative science. What do I mean by that? To understand viruses, you need to know a lot of other sciences. You need to know biology and biochemistry and molecular biology. If you're interested in disease, you have to know epidemiology, ecology, even some sociology to understand how people interact and spread infections. You need to know computational biology to look at viral genomes, model epidemics, and so forth. You need to know a lot of things. That's why I call it an integrative science. One year, a student came down uh, after the end of the course, and she said, I really enjoyed this. I'm a freshman. And you know, freshmen are not supposed to take this course because you don't have biology. And I said, how did you uh, get through it? She said, well, um, I think it's actually going to prepare me better for biology next year because now I understand why all this happens in terms of a virus. So you will see how cells make sense in all the processes they do uh, in terms of virus infection. So that's what I mean when I say virology is an integrative science. So my go goals for this course are pretty straightforward. I want you to see the big picture of virology. This course is not based on viruses. Teaching viruses in a course is not the way to give you an introductory virology course, but that's an easy way to do it. Uh, you know, you could parade someone in every day with a different virus and you would learn about influenza and herpes and polio, but you would never learn virology. You would never get a big picture of what actually happens all the time. And that's what I want to give you. That's why this course is arranged by process. The first half of the course, we're going to talk about the molecular biology of replication, how viruses get into cells, what they do there, what they do to the cells. In the second half, we're going to talk about disease, how they get into a host and spread, how they cause disease and how the immune system deals with them. And then we'll talk about evolution, emergence, antivirals, vaccines as well. So that's what I mean by a big picture. I don't want to teach you virus by virus. Now, if you took an advanced course, that would be quite interesting. But we're going to do it virus by virus. And I want you to think about virology as an integrative discipline, not a collection of viruses, not a collection of genes that don't relate to one another. I'm going to have a core set of viruses, maybe seven or eight different viruses that we're going to always refer to. Uh, they're all different kinds of viruses. And you're going to learn how viruses work by the end by doing that. And you will learn the fundamentals that amaze the informed. So at the end of this course, you're going to be the informed. And everyone else is going to be frightened. Whenever there's an outbreak, people get scared, right? They are, people have a basic fear of what they do not understand. And this is reflected everywhere, not just in people, but in the press, in the way it reports uh, infections and outbreaks. They tend to be sensationalistic. They want to 
uh, so fear in people so that they will read more of what they are writing. But you're going to get beyond all that because you're going to understand what's going on. And I can tell you that years after people take this course, I get emails saying, hey, there was this outbreak and I really understand it because of what you taught and it's still staying with me. So you're going to go out there with an understanding of what is going on in viruses that very few other people have. And you'll be able to look at the popular press and decide what is fake or not in terms of virus outbreaks. So here is, my, is a favorite I like to show. This is a screen capture of a 2009 CNN news report. So there was an outbreak of a new influenza virus at the time. It was causing a pandemic, which is global spread of infection. And some experiments had been done in ferrets, uh, and they're being reported here. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and so someone at CNN uh, got a hold of this, and they summarized the paper, can ravage the lungs, spreads through the respiratory system, causes lesions, doesn't stay in the head like seasonal flu, which is really bad because the head is like, colds don't replicate in your head, they replicate in your upper respiratory tract, but okay. And survivors of 1918 flu are immune. So it turned out that this was a more, one of the more mild influenza viruses that we've seen in years. The results in ferrets didn't mimic it at all. And that's the point about animal models that I'll make over and over to you. Animal models can be useful, but they don't mimic what happens in people. We use them to figure out the rules of engagement. And what they did, and their mistake was here, was to assume that what happened in the ferrets were going to happen in people. And you will not fall to this. You will understand that things reported in animal models are, are different. And throughout this course, I will show you examples of this. And as we have this course, there will be outbreaks, and they will be dealt with in the press in certain ways. And if they're not right, I'll point them out to you. What is a virus? All vi and then there are five answers. Uh, all viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most viral infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting and our immune system cannot handle most virus infections. So pick one that you think is correct. So 98% of you got the right answer. So you didn't get 100%. Most, our immune system can manage most viral infections. Uh, the only others that got some answers, are humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. So uh, the, it's really the opposite. We have many viruses at a time uh, coursing through us. And our immune system cannot handle most viral infections. It's clearly the opposite. So we'll do that every maybe two or three times a lecture and see how you're doing. So, uh, so far you're doing okay. So let's start by defining a virus now because we haven't done that. We've talked a bit about them. What is a virus? So here's my definition. An infectious obligate intracellular parasite made up of genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA. And so here we have a big difference with all other life on the planet, which is DNA-based. Some viruses are DNA-based, but some are also RNA-based. And that's really exciting. We'll talk about that later. And then they can have a protein coat around them, or sometimes they have a membrane. So let's deconstruct this. Infectious. What that means is that the virus can go from cell to cell or from host to host. It can enter the, the cell or the host and reproduce in it and make more virus particles. Obligate intracellular parasite is really important. This means, obligate means you have to do it, and intracellular means you get inside of the cell. So viruses have to get inside a cell in order to reproduce. If they are not in a cell, they're not doing anything. They're just sitting in a liquid, in a tube, in my freezer. Without a cell, viruses do nothing. Remember that. It's, 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 to a lot of people actually don't understand it, but it's quite clear. It's very different from bacteria, for example, which we'll talk about in a moment. Bacteria can grow in a broth, but viruses, if you put them in a broth, they will not grow. They need cells in order to multiply. So that's the obligate intracellular part. And then parasite means they're taking something from the host and harming it. It's not a mutualism where both sides benefit and neither one is harmed. For viruses, they're often harming Although not always, but we're, and we're learning that they're not always harming, but in many cases they do harm, and that's what parasites come from. And then genetic material, I think is clear. We're going to talk about that in quite detail over the next 
few lectures. Uh, and then the viruses can have a, a protein coat or a membrane. So here on the bottom are some viruses that are made up of protein coats. That's an adenovirus, the one that looks like a, a, a satellite. And inside that protein shell is DNA. Uh, here is a, a coronavirus, again, a protein shell. But we have other viruses with membranes. Here's the, uh, the insect virus on the upper right that uh, you would eat if you ate cabbage, for example. And that has a membrane, nucleic acid in the middle surrounded by membrane. Uh, and um, here's, here's a measles virus down here. It's got a membrane with a nucleic acid. So some of them have protein shells, some of them have membranes, and some have both. We'll talk about that in more detail. Now, because viruses are intracellular parasites, when you study them, you're automatically learning about the cell. And that's what I say, every solution reveals something about the host. And I can't tell you how many cellular processes have been discovered through the study of viruses. The one that immediately pops into my head is mRNA splicing. That was discovered in virus-infected cells. All of, most of our knowledge about DNA replication was discovered in virus-infected cells. And that's because they're tractable organisms. They're small and you can purify them and, and do a lot of studies you couldn't do with cells uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So they tell you a lot about the host and we'll reflect that as we go through this course. Now an interesting question is, are viruses living? Are they alive? And this is a poll I have on my blog uh, and these are the results just from the other day. We have about 7,000 people voting. Yes, no, uh, something in between, or I don't know. So you can see pretty much split between yes, no, and something in between. These are just people visiting the blog. Probably a lot of them are high school or elementary school students who have a homework assignment, and they, they blog, they, they Google, are viruses alive, and they end up here. Um, <laughs> And I know this because they write in the comments, thank you for doing my homework. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the public clearly has some issue with this. And I thought about this for many years. Our virus is living. You know, they're particles. What can they do? Nothing until they get into a cell. So really, that is the answer to the question. A virus is an organism with two phases. So there's a non-living phase, the virus or the virus particle. Another word I will use in this course for the infectious virus particle is virion. The virion is infectious, but it, will, it is not alive. It cannot do anything unless it gets into a cell. And then, of course, the infected cell is very much alive, and it's been reprogrammed to make more viruses. So the infected cell is clearly alive, but this virus particle, I, I don't know how you could imagine it, it would be alive because it does nothing on its own. So I think this solves the issue. As long as you realize that if you say virus, you're talking about an organism with these two phases. It's not the virus particle only. And of course, most people, when you say virus to them, they imagine a virus particle. Although I'm not sure most people actually know what a virus particle would look like. All the pictures I'm going to show you in this course are either molecular models like this one, which are based on actual structures of the virus. These are made by computers. We know where every atom is in the virus particle. We can generate models or their drawings. The cartoons, which you can see on the right here. Here's a cartoon of a virus particle. So if you remember that virus is an organism, that's the answer to the question. Of a virus has two phases, one non-living and one alive. One of the things I'd like you to be careful about is to not be anthropomorphic when you think about viruses. All right? And what I mean is don't ascribe human actions to a virus. You know, a virus thinks it can do this, or a virus is trying to infect the host, or trying to evolve, because that contaminates the way you look at the problem. Because you're going to say, you're going to ascribe your own motives and feelings to a virus, which is totally incorrect, because they're not human, obviously. And they're actually passive entities. Everything happens passively. Lots of chemical reactions, selections, natural selection, and evolution but they do not achieve their goals in a human-centered manner. They're passive agents. And I really think this is important because if you, if you think about uh, applying motives to a virus, then it will contaminate, as I said, uh, your ability to understand what actually is going on. And when we wrote our book, we had to work very hard to remove all of these uh, anthropomorphic statements about viruses. There might be, in fact, a, a few still remaining. 
Now, part of, the part of the previous definition of viruses, when I first started teaching this course, uh, you know, an infectious obligate intracellular parasite, part of that used to be small, a small infectious obligate blah, blah, blah. We took it out because we realize now that they're not so, not, some of them are not so small, actually. Um, and here's an electron micrograph just to give you some sense of size. Here's an E. coli at 100,000 X. And uh, over on the top right is a, is a virus, a bacteriophage infecting the E. coli. So you can see it's quite small compared to the bacterium. Uh, next to the phage, this rod-like virus, that's tobacco mosaic virus, it's a virus of plants, the first virus discovered. And HIV is D. And here on the, on the right, under A, that's a panel which is expanded a million fold on the right because these components are very small. They include uh, the ribosome here in G, a carbon atom in A. It's actually much bigger because you can't get much smaller than a pencil dot, right? But that would be a carbon atom tRNA antibody molecules, and here H is a, uh, a virus of about 30 nanometers in diameter, about the same size as the ribosome. And here are some myosin and actin filaments and some enzymes. Enzymes can be rather large. This is an enzyme complex here, M, in the cell. So ribos uh, viruses are uh, at the size of some molecules. Here's another way of looking at this. I want you to get an, just a sense for how viruses relate to cells. Here's a cell on the left, panel B with the nucleus, cytosol with some organelles. And there's a, there are two kinds of viruses which are just outside the plasma membrane. There's a, the larger one is a herpes virus, and that's, that's expanded on the right here. It's about 200 nanometers in diameter. Uh, and then the other is poliovirus, which is about 30 nanometers in diameter. So quite small with respect uh, to the cell. How many viruses can you fit on the head of a pin is, is a question that many people are interested in. And in fact, there's a website uh, that this came from that illustrates this. So here's a pin head. And that is a hair laying across the top of it. Um, this um, pink thing here is a dust mite. This is what inhabits this space under your beds in the dust. Um, and you can inhale them and they can cause allergic reactions. Uh, but let's zoom in into the area to the, to the right there. You can't see much. Uh, and here we have some red blood cells. Uh, we have some pollen. We have some yeast. Uh, those are the big things here. And then here's, here's a bacterium, the green elongated shape. Um, here is uh, Ebola virus there. That elongated virus right there is Ebola virus. For viruses about the size of uh, polio virus, about 30 nanometers, you could put uh, 500 million of them on the head of a pin. And that's about the size of a droplet that you expel when you sneeze or cough. So when you have a common cold, you're expelling millions and millions of viruses. And that's the strategy. Lots and lots of particles, and one of them is going to land on another host and infect it. So we used to think viruses are small. And why that is, you'll see in a moment. It depended on the filters that we used to use to discover viruses. But now we know there are even bigger viruses. So here, uh, over 15 years ago, well, maybe not so long, 2011, this virus, Mimi virus, was discovered. Biggest virus discovered to date. Here is rhinovirus by comparison, HIV. Mimi virus was much bigger. And not only bigger, but had this very interesting uh, hairy coat on the outside. Here's an electron micrograph of two Mimi viruses in an infected cell. And that other particle is a, a, um, another virus, which up to the time was the biggest that we had known. So these Mimi viruses broke all the rules for, for virus size, but that it didn't stop there. We discovered more and more giant viruses. In fact, we continue to discover them uh, every year. Here is a virus called Pandora virus. And this is Shown on the left, this is really remarkable. This is a light microscope photograph. And those are virus particles. No other virus particle can be visualized in a light microscope. You need to lose electron microscopes to see them because they're too small. But this one is about one and a half microns in length. And you can see them in the light microscope. Here's what they look like uh, at high magnification. Um, and they look kind of like a flask. So they were called Pandora's. Pandora virus, and um, they, they have a very long DNA genome. We're going to talk a bit about these because in terms of evolution, they're fascinating. And we've found many, many more of them as well. 
So viruses are no longer defined by size. They have other criteria because they can be really big. Another really important concept about viruses is how they differ from bacteria. Bacteria differ by bin bacteria reproduce by binary fission. Viruses do not do that. Viruses reproduce by infecting a cell. They make the parts needed to make new virus particles, and then they're assembled. That's a really important fundamental difference. Make the parts, assemble the product. So here, let's start in the bottom. Bacteria. <clears throat> you take a single bacterium, you put it in broth, eventually it will divide and become 2 and 4 and 8 and 16 and so forth. It's growing by binary fission, and it will grow until the medium is exhausted. Viruses do not do this. Viruses infect a cell. So here on the top right, we have what we call a growth curve of a virus. You infect a culture of cells, and then you sample the medium at different times, and you measure the production of new infectious viruses. We'll talk about this much more next time. So we're looking at time on the x-axis with the number of infectious particles on the y-axis. So you can see there's a little bit of a lag, and then at some point after infection, you start to see new virus particles produced, and eventually all the cells are killed, and you don't make any more new ones. So why is there a lag? We call this the eclipse period. That's because the viral genome, whether it be DNA or RNA, is getting into the cell, and it's encoding all the proteins needed to make new virus particles. So mRNA has to be made, has to be translated into protein, has to be assembled into new virus particles. So that's the, the eclipse period. And so you don't see new infectious particles until you have enough time to assemble them within the cell. And this is what happens for every virus particle. You make the individual parts and you assemble the new infectious viruses. And we'll talk about this in some detail in one of our sessions. But it's clearly not binary fission, uh, as in bacteria. So let's do another quiz. Question number two. Which of the following is true concerning bacterial versus viral replication? Viruses must assemble using preformed components. The bacteria do not replicate via binary fission, as viruses do. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. The viruses do not have an eclipse period. Viruses replicate by binary fission. 96% of you got uh, the right answer. A, viruses must assemble using preformed components. Of course, bacteria do replicate by binary fission. That's incorrect. Uh, they don't assemble using preformed components. And viruses do have an eclipse period. How old are viruses? We're going to have an entire lecture dedicated to this, but let me whet your appetite. We now have the ability to do lots and lots of sequencing of viruses from all over, plus as I said, their genomes are embedded in the genomes of animals and plants, et cetera. So we can es establish phylogenetic trees and, and look at the viruses as they pass through them. And the oldest uh, one that I know of is this uh, retrovirus that uh, was, is found in some interesting marine nautiloid species like this one, over 450 million years old. Now, that's the Ordovician period about right here where we have, we're through the Cambrian, and we have the first land plants. So these uh, nautiloids were swimming in the oceans and probably were uh, infected with these retroviruses. It could even go back further. In fact, I will tell you that viruses were probably around uh, at the first days on Earth when uh, it was possible to have molecules developing, even before cells. And you may think, well, you just told me you needed a cell in which viruses have to replicate. All right, we'll stay tuned. We'll explain that later. Uh, but in, in more modern history, we see references to viral diseases. 700 BC, uh, this Greek vase has a reference to rabies, rabid Hector on it. And in fact, that referred to someone who had this disease called rabies. Of course, at the time, we didn't know it was caused by a virus. And there on the right is a carving from Egypt, about 1500 BC. And this shows a priest who has a leg which looks like uh, a leg caused by polio. It's a, what we call a drop foot. The leg muscles are paralyzed, and so you cannot keep the foot elevated. It drops, and the leg atrophies. Of course, we can't prove it's polio, but it certainly is uh, what we think polio looked like. People developed immunization way before we knew about viruses. So China in the 11th century practiced variolation. Smallpox was a real problem at the time, infecting many people, and they 
observed that once you had smallpox, if you survived, you never got it again. So they knew it was contagious, but they didn't know what was causing it. And the Chinese practiced variolation. They would take some of the pustules of, of smallpox from a patient, grind them up, and you can see here they're blowing them into a, a person, or they would scarify them into the skin and cause an infection to try and get some, what we now know to be immunity. Of course, uh, some people did die of this because this is not a real vaccine, it's just the wild virus. But that was the first uh, idea of using the agent to prevent disease in the absence of knowing what caused it um, in, the, in the 1790s. And of course, Lady Montague learned of this uh, in the 1700s. She was the wife of the ambassador to Turkey, the British ambassador to Turkey, and she brought it back to the UK. And eventually it spread throughout England. And in the 1790s, Edward Jenner did the first experiments establishing vaccination. Again, we still don't know that it's a virus. In fact, we don't know anything about infectivity or infectious agents, microorganisms. That comes a bit later. It starts with Leeuwenhoek, uh, the Dutch uh, mis uh, microscope maker, who began to look at fluids and was amazed that they're actually small things, smaller than things that you could see, microorganisms. First time anyone had ever seen that. That was in the 16, 1700s. But again, no viruses because he wouldn't be able to see them here. Pasteur, in the 1800s, uh, established that bacteria can do things. They can make cheese and wine and ferment and be useful. And, but it wasn't until Koch, Robert Koch, uh, in, later than, than Pasteur, he established that bacteria could actually cause disease in animals and, and non-human, and humans and non-human animals as well. And that was the concept of microorganisms. But none of these were bacteria. In fact, bac none of these were viruses. Viruses weren't discovered until the end of the 1800s. And as I said earlier, the first virus discovered was tobacco mosaic virus. It was, it was discovered because the, there was a disease of tobacco. And tobacco was already a big uh, economic product. People smoked it, and they didn't like these blotches on the leaves. So a lot of scientists in Europe were trying to figure out what caused it. And two individuals found at the end of the 1800s, so by then we knew about bacteria, and, and we knew that you could filter out bacteria on filters of certain pore sizes. So people were grinding up these leaves and asking, is a bacterium cause, causing this? And in 1892 and 98, two different individuals found that the infectivity passed through the filters that would normally hold back bacteria. And so they said, there's something different. It's either a really small agent or it's a chemical, but it's going through the filter. And furthermore, it will not grow in the broth. You have to put it back on tobacco leaves in order for whatever it is to grow. And this originated the concept of virus. So virus is actually a Latin word meaning slimy liquid or poison, because they thought it was a liquid at the time. It wasn't until later that we understood that they were particles. But again, the size of these filters was about 2.2 microns. And today you can buy uh, highly high-tech filters for your laboratory at high, high expense, which have 0.2 micron filters, and we use these to sterilize fluids. The viruses will go through them, and the bacteria are remained behind. It's the same principle. For many years, we used 0.2 microns as the definition of a virus, smaller than 0.2 microns. But we now know many viruses which are bigger than that, and that's why we don't use it as part of the definition anymore. After those two discoveries, virus discovery it began to accelerate. 1898, first animal virus, foot and mouth disease virus, which infects cattle. So here's a cow with the lesion on the mouth caused by this virus. It's, it's agriculture, a very important virus. You don't want to have this infecting your cow herds. Uh, and again, the key concepts, not only were these small agents, but they did not replicate in the broth. They had to replicate uh, in the cells. 1901, the first human virus, yellow fever virus, discovered because they were trying to dig the Panama Canal and the diggers would keep getting yellow fever and dying and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And so a number of people went there to study it and figured out not only was it a mosquito-borne agent, but it turned out to be a virus. Rabies, 1903, smallpox virus, some uh, leukemia viruses of chickens, polio virus, another cancer-causing virus, and we'll come back to these two later on. These led to our understanding of cancer, bacteriophages, and influenza virus. But 
not at really huge pace, right? Because the tools that we had weren't so great. So here's a nice graph of the discovery, cumulative number of discoveries over time. So the green are bacteria. And you can see with Koch's introduction of efficient bacteriological methods, the bacterial discovery went up. TMV discovered at the end of the 1800s, and then our viruses, filterable viruses, uh, we begin to discover more and more of those. All right, our last quiz question. What is a key concept first discovered about viruses that distinguish them from other microorganisms? They're too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. They only replicate in broth. They made tobacco plants sick. They were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. None of the above. If most of you got D. They were, too, they were small enough to pass through a filter. Now, a lot of you took C, they made tobacco plants sick, but that wouldn't tell you it's a virus. It could have been a bacterium, right? So the key was passing uh, through the filter. In the 1930s, the electron microscope was invented in Germany, and we began to be able to see that viruses were not liquids, they were particles. We saw particles of all different shapes and sizes, bacteriophages, tobacco mosaic virus, the rod-shaped one, rabies, and other viruses. And today, our knowledge of virus structure is astounding. We have we know where every atom is in viruses. These are two structures of poliovirus at very high resolution and at lower resolution. We know the chemical formulas for viruses, which we never knew before. And you'll learn some of this in this course. We have to classify viruses because there's so many of them that we put them into families and so forth. Today, it's largely the sequence of the nucleic acid that dictates how we classify viruses. But in the past, we've looked at what the protein shell looks like, whether there's an envelope or not, and how big they were. But today, if you find a new virus, you sequence its genome and you immediately classify it uh, by computational biology methods. And I will somewhat talk about uh, different names of classification. We use this classical hierarchical system, as you see here. We, in viruses, we mainly use orders, families, genera, and species. So for an example, a, a family virus family would be filoviridae or filovirus family, which contains Ebola viruses. That would be further broken up into genera, like Ebola virus. And then there is a species name, Zaire Ebola virus. But I have an asterisk here because uh, unlike classification of a species in other organisms, there is actually no species. This is a construct which is used only to help you classify viruses. The actual virus isolates would lie below the species level. So where there would be homo sapiens, we are homo sapiens, there would be no virus called Zaire Ebola virus. We used to discover viruses because they caused disease. You know, yellow fever, for example, influenza, smallpox. It was a disease, we looked for the cause, we found a virus, but now we don't do that entirely anymore. We just sequence environments. We look for viromes all over. And here's an example of that. This is a great study out of China where they looked at uh, viruses and insects, crustaceans, nematodes, mollusks, lots of life forms that had never been sampled before. Simply collecting them, grind them up, and do sequencing to find new virus genomes. And uh, these are, these bars are the different kinds of viruses they found in each of these species. So these are uh, RNA viruses likely, and in this particular analysis, they looked at RNA from 220 species and found 1,400 new viruses. And in fact, as you look, you find more viruses. Eventually, we will, of course, reach some asymptotic point where we don't find any new ones anymore, but we are far from that. If you go out and sample almost anything out there, you will find uh, new viruses. And this can lead us into understanding where viruses come from, and we'll talk about that later. Now, why do, you care, why do we care about any of this except that viruses cause disease? Well, they out, viruses outnumber cellular life on Earth by at least 10 to 1. So they are the greatest biodiversity on the planet. Nothing comes close. There are a lot of bacteria, but there are more viruses. And so that's amazing. As I said, I just mentioned briefly, they drive global cycles. They turn over uh, organic particulate matter in the oceans, and that liberates uh, various elements that we need. We think they can be beneficial, and many people are working on understanding that. And of course, then there's that 
at the end there, they can be sources of new pathogens, and we want to know about that. We want to know about what's out there and what might be causing uh, new diseases. But this course will not focus entirely on disease. It will look at viruses as a whole and trying to understand uh, how they work. Now, I've, I've told you that there are lots of viruses out there. You can discover thousands and thousands of them quite easily. But we can actually make some simplicity out of that because of two things that we understand about viruses. First of all, they're obligate molecular parasites that only will function in a cell. They can only reproduce after they get in the cell, as I've told you. So that's one. And the second is that they have to make mRNA that can be translated by the host cell. And that's because they need to be recognized by uh, this structure, which is actually a turkey. It's actually a ribosome, but it looks like a turkey. <laughs> so that all viruses have to make mRNA that can be recognized by cellular ribosomes. So that gives us a nice classification system. And we're going to do that next week. We're going to talk about all these viruses, putting them basically into seven categories based on these two uh, very simple facts. But on Monday, we're going to do the infectious cycle, which is basically understanding what viruses do in cells and, and a lot of the methods that we use to study them and which we'll use uh, throughout the rest of the course.